This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is psychopomp. Salutations, hail and well met readers and reviewers. Today's guest, I'm very excited to talk to Shauna Germain. Shauna Germain is an award-winning writer, editor, and game designer, and the co-owner of Monty Cook Games. Welcome, Shauna. I'm very glad to Thank have you. Thank you. Here. Thanks for having me. So uh, as regular viewers know, we always dress up in costume like this, <laughs> and uh, and but then we have to describe them for the podcast listeners. So what did you choose to wear today? So I chose, if you have ever seen the show, you will know exactly the character I'm talking about. Villanelle, who's an assassin, wears this big taffeta dress and these black combat boots. Uh, and it, the show is Killing Eve. And so I have that, my hair's all up in a bun. And just have that look on my face and about my parents that says, I speak six different languages. Uh, I slept with the hottest girl in the building last night, and now I'm off to, off to poison some super important person. Yep. Oh, and <laughs> you got it. Nailed it. Uh, perfect. And I went with, you know, the kind of cliche supervillain look, which is turtleneck and a suit coat. Like, who uh, who wears turtlenecks and, and blazers except <laughs> supervillains in spy movies? Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it, to, to be in the vibe, I've, I've got the suit I love it. thing down, so... Um, so, uh, I have been excited to get to find out about what's been going on with you in terms of your, your, you know, your writing lately. What is the thing that you have been, uh, working on lately that has been fun for you, uh, in terms of your writing? Well, I finished, so just recently, uh, at the end of last year, I finished two games, both of which I super love, um, because I do a lot of game design and one is called the devil's dandy dogs. And it's this really low prep game where you have big like tarot kind of cards and you play uh, dogs, a pack of dogs who are out gathering souls for the devil. And so it's this very narrative, fast paced kind of game. Um, and the devil's very, well, dandy <laughs> as are his dogs. Um, and it's it's um, it's just a lot of fun. And like when we, every time we've played it, someone has cried, which is ultimately always my goal. <laughs> <So> that's fantastic, <laughs> makes me so happy. Um, and then I also finished the Old Gods of Appalachia role-playing game, which is a horror game. Uh, it's a very different vibe. It's um, it, it will scare the pants off of you without a doubt because it's just um, deep and dark and spooky. And you have to really make these intense deals in order to save your families and your souls and all this kind of stuff. So it's really uh, very different, but also very fun. Um, the thing I'm working on right now, this seems to be a theme, <laughs> is... Uh, is uh, I'm revising my novel, which is called uh, The Music of Spiders. And it's about a psychopomp who has to take a living girl through the underworld. Oh. It's my big project currently. So it's, uh, it's it's you know, Dante, uh, you know, but uh, but modern. Yeah. And, uh, that sounds very yes. cool. Yeah. yeah. So when you are creating these games, how much are you doing the kind of the math of the games? And how uh -huh. much is the writing of the games? Because it's you know, those are both. Yeah, in both those games, I designed them both. Um, Devil's Dandy Dogs has hardly any math because it's not um, it's not that kind of game. It's much more narrative. Uh, the tarot cards actually do a lot more than the dice. There's only a six-sided dice, so it's very simple. Um, and then for the Cypher System game, which is what the Old Gods of Appalachia is, a lot of the, the rules-based stuff is has been done already because it's the same uh, Cypher System rule set that Old Gods uh, kind of uses with a few exceptions. We tweaked some things, like you have to your, the things that you use that are magic come due and you have to make deals with the mm. entities that created them. And so there's this sort of uh, really wonderful feel to that. Uh, so mostly a lot of what I did in that was we used the basic cipher system stuff that already existed and then world build it and sort of it created the theme and the atmosphere, which are places that I really love. Yeah. And um, it's really my strengths. So like with, when I start getting too tied down into the math, um, my neuro spicy brain is like, <laughs> we're yeah. done here. Uh, go make some words and make it pretty. Um, so it's kind of a perfect, a perfect setup for me in that way. 
Oh, that's great. And so that, that world building process, how does that work for you? Like, I don't want to get too much into process, mm -hmm. not a process show, but I think that is interesting for readers, like different, you know, some of us start out, you know, uh, uh, you know, 30,000 feet and kind of zoom in. And some of us find a, a, a space that feels like the, you know, the, the, the space that we want to be in and build out from there. How do you think yeah. about that developing that world? You know, I think every world is different. So they all start very differently for me. But for the most part, they start with this sound. I'm very, you know, I was a poet in the first part of my writing life. And so the sound of words is really important to me. And this, the language of this, of the place, of the people, uh, of the characters, or internal monologue, these are all places that I start uh, with world building because I do believe that like language builds our viewpoint and our world and the way in which we use language um, is such a big part of that. And so I, I try to start finding these kind of core words or core sounds that really speak to me as, as part of the setting. And then I kind of build outward from there. If I'm doing fiction, I start with a character and their POV, their point of view, and then I build out from the things that they see and the way that they see them. Uh, if I'm doing game design, I, I do start a little bit more from the top because games have a different need. They ha You yeah. have to have certain things for the players to get engaged. And so you can kind of start with these pillars of like, is there religion? What is the, you know, are there different races and how does that work? Are there, you know, do people care about things like gender in a, in a way that's different from our world? Um, you know, what are the buildings made out of? And, and that starts suddenly leading you, like if none of the buildings are made out of wood, are there even forests in this world? Like, right. and so you can kind of start like putting these puzzle pieces in and building outward, um, which is actually, oh, I love that so much. I love those yeah. moments when you're like, oh, here's a thing and here's how it works in the rest of the world. And I just get very kind of geeked out about that. Yeah, I, I don't know that, you know, that, that readers think about it in this way, but when we're doing will, world building, we're playing a narrative game by ourselves. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's play. You know, we really get to go. Well, what what happened? You know, what what happens next? What's around the corner? I just get to decide, and so yeah, yeah. it is really that part is really fun. The I do editing can be a grind, but the uh, the world building is a kick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. So, uh, what has been? It's a show about procrastination. You've been doing an incredible amount of work. What's pulling you away from that lately, in terms of pop culture, that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, it's I I am very. I'm someone who loves to get really immersed into something new, into a single thing. Uh, so like it changes from week to week. <laughs> like this week, I just discovered this thing, this game called Demio, which is like a VR game that you can play with other people. It's like you go in and you fight things and you move your character around. And I'm just sort of obsessed with it all of a is sudden. Is that on so the fun. Oculus? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I should and check that one out. <laughs> like it, it, it is very much like being around the table because of the 3D part and the fact yeah. that you can roll dice and move your characters. The rules, well, I, <laughs> we won't talk about the rules because they're not super clear, but that's okay. I really like it. That's been a thing I've um, been really loving lately. Um, I also am a big, like I try to read for like half an hour every night. And sometimes when I get into a book, I, uh, I that, that becomes a procrastination thing, but I feel like that's fair and safe. Um, the work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've been reading um, Mona Awad. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, has written some fantastic novels. I just finished her novel, Bunny, which is the weirdest thing I've ever read. And I loved it Ooh. so much. So that was a huge, and I'm onto her new one right now. Also totally weird, like this weird Shakespeare recreation that I love. Um, and then, you know, the new season of True Detective is definitely, yes. uh, and I'm rereading Hack Slash, which is a kind of older comic book series that I- oh, I I'm trying read. to remember. I was like, I know that name, but yeah. I'm not- <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's a graphic novel or is it, it uh, is it, you know, comic book series? Um, You know, I don't actually know the distinction enough I mean, to- Did you get it as a compendium? Of I got it as a compendium. Yeah, like yeah. It, it's a couple That's of compendiums. So I think something I can it might be a graphic novel. Of. Yeah, I don't know. But I love it. <laughs> I have been, I've been in True Detective. So, you know, uh, watching series TV now, I, I'm to the point where, you know, just about any show, I'm like, okay, I can sit down and I can binge this. And True Detective, I'm having to wait. It's forcing me to wait. I know. I know. I'm into it. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, th those kind of on demand TV yeah. moments for a change where I'm going, oh my gosh, what is possibly going to happen next? And is this next week the last one? Or I think it is. I think it is the last one. And I we just watched. I just watched the. Oh, sorry. I'm, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, and I also just watched the last the new season of Fargo, which I absolutely adored. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I've gotten now. What was the other one? I think Murder at the End of the World was the mm -hmm. one that I watched before that. That was sort of 
drawn out. And yeah, I'm so unused to having to wait. I'm not good at waiting. So <laughs> being forced to wait. Yeah. But uh, yeah, True Detective is certainly worth it. It has been really a trip. And uh, yeah. Yeah, Murder at the End of the World, I, I, I started the first episode and it starts slow enough that my partner was like, nope, this is too slow for me. She wasn't into it. And yeah. I'm like, that's one I should go back to because that, I like that slow build. And, and yeah. True Detective I had like a couple of slow lot. episodes too, but boy, they were creepy slow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what about in the news? What's been kind of pulling you away from pulling your attention away from your work? You know, I tend to sort of dip into the news only when I feel like I have the mental capacity for it, which is the world that we live in is limited. Um, and so I try to do that sort of at the end of the week when I have kind of done what I need to do. I can sit with that information. I used to be sort of an information junkie. And then I realized that like it wasn't doing me any good and it wasn't doing the world any good. So now I pay attention and I donate um, and I vote and I do all the things that are really important to me. I, I like I volunteer with this organization where you can, um, you know, if someone who is is trans or gay or queer doesn't have a, f a family member at their wedding, I can go and I can be oh, there. Oh, cool. Yes. Mom, you thought about aunt. doing that, being parents. So at, lovely. Yes. yes uh, um, my partner and I talked about doing that. Yeah, it's really, I really recommend it. It's just so wonderful. And, you know, you can even just go be someone's friend or mentor yeah. and like, you know, as a 52 year old bisexual woman, like I want to do, I want to give back to those people that gave back to me when I was young. Um, so yeah, so it, like when I feel like the news, I, I'm careful around because my real goal to change the world is to write and being too involved in the news can keep me from writing. And there are people out there who need to hear the things that I have to say that so that they can survive and feel good about themselves and see themselves seen in my work. And that's, that's the priority. So that's a weird answer to a question about no, it's news. Not. But... It's not. It's really valid. My friend and I were talking about this this last week. She does a lot of advocacy for you know queer women and you know this queer community, and also she's neurodivergent, and so she's really outspoken about that. And we were kind of debating because she uh, you know will will find herself in a position where she says I can't make any progress with this person. This is not where I'm going to focus my advocacy. And I feel like no, you know, as a teacher, I've got to think about this person is going to be harming my students i have to try and persuade everybody and we have very different kind of positions on that and then we ha i had to kind of step back and say yeah and we have different roles and like yes. for her a lot of her activism is existing like she is going to continue in to exist as a marginalized person in the world and as cishet straight white guy my role is to say that person who will never listen to you may listen to me and i have to, you know and so we you know thinking about how we interact in the world based on who we are like she does not have the energy and the and the the space to try and deal with everybody who is never going to listen to her yeah. and so how you know how do we balance that is going to be different depending on who we are so i end up being the you know like total news junkie to 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 a point where you're right it often is not doing me or the world any good but I'm trying to figure out, is there something I can glean here that could be persuasive or helpful to somebody who will listen to me? And she has to go, no, that's it's never going to work for me because as soon as I present myself, that person's going to stop listening. And it's true. Yeah. Like, So yeah. finding that, finding our roles is uh, is incredibly important. Uh, but yeah, so have, there, have you found some happy news stories lately <laughs> that are those good stories to share? You know, I it's it's such an interesting thing. So I did a lot of like, I did a lot more protesting and stuff when I was younger. And I ran a feminist women's magazine that was sort of really go geared toward like bringing women together because it was an era where like, like it wasn't even okay for me to be bisexual because I just couldn't choose. And so like, we were just trying oh, to bring yeah. women together and be like, look, let's yeah. support each other. Um, and so now I do find myself so delighted when I see the sort of next generation of people of all genders, all sexualities, all or you know, everybody doing things that are are working really hard to bring people together because I think we're so divided within our subsections that it's really easy for people who want to play us against each other to do so. Uh -huh. And so my favorite news stories are the ones where we're starting to see people uh, really reject that yeah. and, and come together and support each other and be powerful in that way because it's so important for our future yeah. that we're able to do that. Yeah, and this next generation, I'm watching the my students and they give me so much hope because they yeah. are conscious of intersectionality and they're willing to say, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to pit us against one another and we're not going to do that for you. Yeah. And part of the way it manifests is they are so much cooler about like, Issue, questions of identity that aren't threatening. So I'll have, you know, students sitting next to one another and, and one of them is going, I'm bi and another one's going, I'm pan. And these are the distinctions for us 
and it's not a battle. And I'm like, oh, that's so healthy rather than, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm by and I'm pan and therefore we're in different buckets and you're wrong. Like, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it is, the kids are all right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love that so much. It just gives me so much hope and, yeah. and so much power to continue to be, you know, sort of the queer auntie of anybody who wants it. Like, right? yeah. because, because they do need support. They're not just going to do that, be able to do that on their own. And knowing that there are people out there ahead of them who've paved a different path, but have still, you know, paved that path and done cool things is, I think, so important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what about hobby? And I know this is, you know, a rough transition, but <laughs> from there, what about hobbies? Uh, what's been getting in the way of your work? Oh, man, I, you know, again, neurospicy brain, I get involved with anything and I get super into it. I've learned not to buy all the things because. <laughs> oh, yeah. My, my partner hobby. says she doesn't have hobbies. She has the hobby of collecting hobbies. Oh, God. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, So I uh, right now I'm really into leather stuff. I've been painting leather and doing leather craft, which is kind of a fun um thing. I'm not very good at it. I stab myself with the all, but that's OK. <laughs> that's part of it. <laughs> um, And then I did this thing uh, a couple years ago when I turned 50, where I went and had my colors done and like which is something my grandmother did like when she was in her 50s. And so you learn like what colors look good on you and I had my style done. And I just, it, it just got really into that for a while too. Of like, you know, because when you get to the sort of second half of your life, you don't really want to like, there are a lot of things. I don't want to look like I'm 20 because I'm not, and I don't want to look like I'm a hundred either. And so like, what do I look, you know, what is, what does sort of 50 something year old me look like? So I was really into that. So I still do a lot of thrifting and trying to find cool things that I love, um, you know, in my colors. What does that entail finding out how to, I mean, I don't even, you know, I am like the most bland human being in the no, world. What is finding, getting your colors done entail? So they go and they put you like up next to a window with no makeup on your face and they pull your hair back. And then they just put colors against your face for like, I don't know, it takes like, it takes like an hour and a half. It's sort of wild. And after a while, you can start to see like, oh, you know, sh I should not wear black because it makes me look dead. And my entire wardrobe was black. At that yeah, point. yeah, that's most of my clothes. <laughs> All I've ever worn is black. Um, and so they just they just start doing this thing where they and so then they're like, OK, so this blue looks better than this blue. And so then eventually they tell you that you're in a season. So I'm a spring, I'm a bright blue spring, which is like shirts like this are like bright blue for me. Yeah. Um, so like I can, like it tells you kind of like, I can wear like geranium colors and um, really intense purples and just all these like chocolate browns. So they kind of give you this range of colors um, that look best with your skin and and a range of hair color. And it's just really fascinating stuff. Did you uh, find that there were colors that were in your kind of season and that you know but that you weren't comfortable in like oh I, pink tones for me like people be like oh you look good in that brown and i'm like yeah but i hate brown like i just don't you know feel comfortable in earth tones of any kind mine is pink pink is like pink looks so good on me and i yeah yep i think so much yes. i i wore it once and i was i got all these compliments and i'm so mad about it <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. Like, no. yeah, it's great that you think this is my color, but I don't like wearing it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't I like wearing that. pink even when I was a kid. I was much more of a tomboy. So pink is definitely the color. But like, I there's a lot of like, um, I get a lot of pumpkin and chocolate brown and like those colors I really, really dig. Those yeah. those feel like home to me. Comfort colors. Yeah. 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 Um, excellent. So uh, what else, <laughs> what, what other kinds of, you know, you've got the thrifting. Uh, what else like, uh, you know, uh, uh, puzzle, you know, I, I know that you are a Lego person as well. I <laughs> that's, that's That speaks to my soul. Like my, my partner literally owns a Lego store. Like we have no way. full of Lego. That's so cool. yeah. So have you been doing any of that lately? Yeah. You know what I, I so last year I did the first big Ninjago city, oh. which I don't know anything about Ninjago, but the colors and the angles and the weirdness of it, it's like, yeah. here's a skater and here's a medieval knight and here's a dragon under the water and a tower in the city. And I'm just like, I don't know what's happening here at all, but it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I finished that last year. And then this year I'm working on the second, there's like an addition to that and they're huge and they're wobbly and they're kind of I don't know, they're a little bit complex and there's a lot of water, but I find that when I do Lego, I I can think about the novel that I'm working on in a way because there is this sort of repetition yeah. of, of placing pieces, um, which isn't always the best thing because I find sometimes I have to go back very many steps and <laughs> 
Right. Yeah, yeah, you missed that one piece, but still, you're right. It is a different kind of brain space. So I can yeah. like listen to a podcast and build Lego. Like it's yeah. not, you know, and and still hear or the audio book or whatever, uh, because it is a different kind of uh, of of learning that is going on. But yeah, yeah. like Lego are, you know, I highly encourage folks, not just the ones who want to buy from my partner store. <laughs> oh, that's nice. But Lego is good for the soul. Like it really is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And puzzles too kind of do that. And like when I, in cooking and gardening are all things that I feel like I, there's that repetition of your hands that you know what you're doing. And it allows my mind to do a lot. Um, walking the dog and hiking and stuff are, are right up there as well. Yeah. 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 We've got uh, two new puppies. And uh, so, yes, they, they, they are, uh, uh, they're a lot, uh, but uh, yes, that I'm yeah, when... walking the dog is, you know, they're learning. And so it's like, you have to be aware enough because they yes. will, run around you and around everything and that kind of thing but at the same time it's that you know space um so yeah that, I, I totally hear that one. <laughs> um so one of the questions i like to kind of explore with authors and this is just a mechanism to get to know you is <laughs> what did, if you were a character in the world of dungeons and dragons what would be your race and class um so the re i would pick something that um is near and dear to my heart, has been for a long time, which is I ran a guild in EverQuest 2 for many years, which tells you both how old I am and how much of a geek I am. Um, and in that, I played the long, like I'm someone who starts new characters a lot. But in that guild, I played my longest running character. I leveled her all the way up and she was a half elf rogue. Um, and so I feel like there's something about her that really clicked with my younger self and you know, I, I ran this really great guild that was super supportive. We had people from all genders and all orientations and it had this super open space. People were exploring who they were. Yeah. And so I feel like I, I would have to pick the half elf row just because of that heart space for me. Plus and she so, was a ton of fun to play. Yeah, well, and so when you think about that character and the kind of mechanics of it, but also, you know, the way that that, that she interacted in the world, what is, do you think that reveals about who you are? Yeah, that's a great, such a great question. Um, I think that sh I think that there's I have this sort of trickstery side. Like I was just talking to a friend and I was saying that like every time I start a game, I want to be a villain. I want to be I want to be in this the thieves guild so bad. I want to be an assassin. But the first time someone cries at me and needs help, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so all my characters end up being good, even though I want to be yeah. sort of an evil character. Um, and so I feel like a rogue walks that really fine line of like. A little trickstery, a little sly, might steal out of your pocket, but also probably has a big heart and will help you if you need it. And if she steals out of your pocket, it's to give it to someone else. And so I feel like that's a lot of my personality. It's, I really want to be a bad girl. <laughs> like the, the punks are like, I look really scary. And I also am like the sweetest person you'll ever meet. Like, yes, yeah. that's <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, okay. So you've got this half elk rogue and you are ambushed in the woods by three level one goblins. These are not, <laughs> you know, dangerous characters to you. What do you do? Well, I feel like what I do is I probably, I probably found this crow who was injured when it was little and I healed it. And so now it's my friend. And so the crow and I convinced the goblins that we should all be friends and we just go tracing the woods together. <laughs> Perfect. And I love that <laughs> you've got to acquire the crow before the convincing of the goblins can. Yeah, the crow helps. Play. The crow helps, yeah. yes. And probably excellent. brings them shinies as part of the deal, oh, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we, we've talked about how do we, you know, in fact, my partner Crystal has even done some research on this. How do we build a crow army? There are people who do this where they like train the local crows to come to their house and just hang out. And we're like, that would be it. That would be the dream. Um, <laughs> so. I have Stellar's Jays at my house. I don't have crows, but I have Stellar Jays, which are really smart. And, um, and they are, when, when I go out and call, when I go out and call them, they come for peanuts, which I love. <laughs> that's excellent. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> but they do not like the dog. And so if I'm out with the dog, they just yell at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, pickle. <laughs> But they're training you, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> leave the dog inside and come give us peanuts. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. Uh, excellent. So we're going to go to our ad break real quick. But when we come back, I'm going to ask you what you've been daydreaming about lately. Special announcement time. Not a Pie Publishing has always been committed to helping authors and readers find one another. Well, the show, which is all about helping readers get to know writers, just hit a milestone. 10,000 views on YouTube. 
So to celebrate, instead of charging authors to advertise their books on the show, I'm gonna run your ads for free throughout 2024. If you wanna make a 30 to 60 second video about your book, let folks know what it's about and where to find it. And don't forget your name and the title. Uh, I'll run one or two of those in our ad spot each week. Just send an MP4 file to the Not A Pipe email address in the show notes. Let's fix up some readers and authors into reader relationships. 2024, more readers, more writers, more books. Hello, my name is Fred Gambino. I've worked in the story industry for four decades as a film and game concept artist and a book cover artist. My love of story has led me to write my debut novel, Dark Shepherd, to be published by Newcom Press in May 2024. A fast-paced science fiction action thriller, it opens on the beach, where starships are crashed from orbit in order to break them up. Breel is in charge of several giant dismantling machines, and her job is to further take apart the shattered ships. Semi-freelance, she is one of many teams who work the beach, making money on the load she collects and sends to central processing. But the beach is a difficult place. Subject to misogyny and racism, she is unjustly fired, setting off a sequence of events that leads to her fleeing across the galaxy in the company of a ragtag group of misfits, pursued by agents of the ruthless and politically powerful Church of Second Light for a secret she didn't know she possessed. Only Brill can locate a mysterious rip, a wormhole that will leave humanity vulnerable to an ancient enemy, and only she stands a chance of closing it. Available for pre-order now at www.newcompress.co.uk An Accidental Hero, a mostly true Wombat story by Laura Rediger and Debbie Palin is based on events during the aftermath of the Australian bushfires in 2020. Rescuers discovered animals sheltering in wombat burrows. Wombats were praised for providing a safe refuge underground. While they didn't invite other wildlife into their homes, they did truly become accidental heroes. The book is written as a newscast, with Koala and Emu at the news desk. Field reporter Kangaroo introduces readers to Wombat and her new friends. An Accidental Hero, a Mostly True Wombat Story by Laura Rediger and Debbie Palin. A STEM picture book published by Ifrig Publishing, available at ifrigpublishing.com or wherever books are sold. For more about the author, go to lauraredigerbooks.com. Welcome back, everybody. Shauna, what have you been daydreaming about lately? You know, I have read this fantastic book last year called Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. It's by this fantastic author, Marissa Franco. Um, and it I have been I have been thinking so much about friendship lately because I think the pandemic kind of did a lot of damage to a lot of friendships that were just sort of existing. Maybe I should only speak for myself. No, they did some damage to my thing. friendships yeah. that were only existing. Um, and I I realized that I really wanted to do the work of creating deep, close friendships, which is a very vulnerable space for me. Um, I'm someone who uh, feels nervous when people really know me, but I really want people to know me. Um, and so it's a very, I don't know, it's very tricky. Uh, so I read this fantastic book and, and it made me think about friendships a lot. And it changed my perspective on friendships. And I think one of the biggest things I took away was this idea was that, I think it's called the likability gap, where you think that people don't like you as much as they actually do. And so you don't reach out because you're like, I was always like, well, what if they don't want to hear from me? What if I'm overstepping, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I was, and as soon as I was reading about that, and then she offers all these great tips about how to actually go out and find or make or deepen friendships. And I was just like, this is a thing that I want to do. And so actually maybe this is more of a hobby. I don't know. But um, but I I started just sort of doing the work of being like, what do what do I want my friendships to look like? Because I'm an introvert, because I'm have a neuro spicy brain, because I'm a creative, I realized that I needed people who either were those things or could understand those things. Because if you have friendships who require too much as an introvert, you spend all your time feeling like you're not giving enough, like you're not there enough. The other person feels like you don't care. Um, and so I'd spent, I, I started deepening all the friendships that I had already in my life that really mattered to me and reached out some, to some people I'd lost touch with. Um, and then also started working to be more willing to put myself out there and be like, hey, I think you're so cool. Can we be friends? <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's such a hard space. 
Oh, I am. I am. I, I, I love this because I struggle with this myself. I am very much an extrovert, which lends itself to kind of superficial friendships. Mm. And when I find I need deeper friendships, I go, oh, but then the person will get to know me and they're not going to like me anymore. Yes. It's superficial because <laughs> that's what's comfortable for me. Right. Right. And yeah. I, have to go, but I do need people, you know, and, and, and you're, you're right. The pandemic was tough because what made up for it in the past was, oh, well, I was seeing these folks a lot. And so I could go, okay, well, I'm not sure if this person actually likes me, but we're just in contact frequently. Yeah. And now I'm like, I would have to do the, the outreach to, and, and do I want to do the outreach? And is that, is that just going to be painful because I'm going to find out, no, that, you know, I'm going to get burned. And so what, what are some things that have worked? Well, it, to be clear, it hasn't always worked. I have gotten burned a couple of times. Um, but I think, um, so I will say that, 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 this was also tied into going through some really intense therapy for me. Uh, I'm also a fan of therapy. Yes, uh, me too. <laughs> um, thumbs up. Um, so I did a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy to get through some really deep baggage that, you know, when you're successful and driven and resourceful, like you don't even think anything is wrong with you necessarily because you, you, you can do it. Um, and my therapist is always like, uh, just cause you survived does not mean you're thriving. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, that's legit. Um, so it, it was hand in hand with some therapy about, rejection and, and, you know, all this other, all the other traumas that we all carry, uh, in different ways. And so, um, so I, one of the things that I started doing was just telling people how much I appreciated them and being really willing to, that's vulnerable to be like, I'm so glad you're in my life. I adore this thing about you. I would, you know, I would love to, to get to know you better. Like all these things that like, I'm going to start, I'm tearing up just thinking about it because it's so deep and it's so important and it's so hard. Yeah. Um, And, and, also being right so many of us mask ourselves so often like someone once said something about having it being easier to get fans than friends Mm. and I saw myself in that and I realized that holding people at a distance was very safe for me because like you said they don't know me they think I'm awesome from a distance and I I was afraid um and so some of that's being really vulnerable and being like you know what if it's okay if they're not my people that's okay and also giving without expectation of reciprocity is a really important part of that. Like I can say to someone, I think you're fucking, am- Ooh, shit. I think you're amazing. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Sorry. Totally fine. I-, I think you're amazing and not need them to feel that way about me because this is a gift that I'm giving them because they're awesome. And I, and I really like them and I want them to know it. Um, and it's changed my relationship with my family. It's changed my personal relationship. It's changed my work and my friends and like everything, just being willing to be vulnerable. And a few friendships have exploded because I, as part of that, was able to say, like, look, I, I need this from you if we're going to maintain this friendship, whether that was, you know, respect or boundaries or whatever that thing was. And not everyone's willing to do that. And that's OK, too. But if you don't, if you just stay over here all the time, you're never going to know if they can give you what you need because you don't ask for it. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of it has just been being so brave <laughs> and yeah. I hate it, <laughs> but it has really reaped uh, wonderful rewards. I have great friendships. I feel so lucky. Um, I have amazing people in my life and they're closer to me now and I get to be closer to them and see all of their amazing coolness and weirdness and wonders. And that's, I mean, really, that's that's it. That's everything. Yeah. One of the things that I uh, benefited greatly from a couple of dear friends uh, uh, sharing this kind of insight with me, I was treating any kind of reciprocity, including like the most casual praise, like, hey, I think you did a good, you know, I liked your book kind of stuff. I was rejecting compliments Yeah. As as a way of like, projecting humility i think and i think that was you know and there's trauma and there's childhood stuff there too right but it was a way of nah 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 and i had some friend and but it, even when it came to greater needs you know where people were saying i am offering to help you with this or that and i was pushing that away and uh some some really uh dear friends of mine bethany lee a fantastic poet and then laura Waite, one of my dearest friends and colleagues were like you need to start learning that when somebody is offering you help that that is a gift and when you push that away you are sometimes the best way for you to think of it is that you are helping by accepting that yeah and that was hard for me to go oh i need to say thank you and take that help rather than saying i don't need it but you know it's nice for you to offer but no 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 and and then you know i'm i'm burning that 
that connection that the person is making. So that's yeah. that has been challenging for me to learn is, you know, that this self-sufficiency leads to isolation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy, I I hear that, right? I, I mean, I've just, I've done so much because I'm so independent, independent, but at the same time, you know, you, you end up doing a lot of it alone and, or, you know, with people that are just, yeah, a little bit distant, but yeah, accepting compliments or gifts or help or, oh uh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a surprisingly scary, vulnerable place yeah. for so many of us. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, I, yeah, it just gets so uncommon, so hard for me, but you know, to be able to, and it's easy for me to say to my students, the way that you respond to feedback is to say, thank you. You know, yeah. like it's easy when it's somebody else <laughs> and then it's me and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so right. working, working on that right um, which, is, which is even not even just rejecting the gift but then asking them to do more work yeah. right when you say things like oh no then you're asking them to sort right. of come back at you right yeah. which is the whole, the whole second level of yes that Supporting. was the thing for me that I was like oh I'm putting work on their plate yeah by saying that and so that was that was the thing that got me to start saying okay I can I can just say thank you and take that yeah. and and be okay yeah yeah, yeah, accepting reciprocity. That's yeah, that is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, why, why, why do so many of my friendships end up, you know, running into these barriers? Oh, because I'm putting up those barriers. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so learning that has been challenging. Yep. Yeah, self awareness. Yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> So uh, what's one thing you want listeners to learn about about what's going on with you right now in terms of your career? Um, in terms of my career, um, uh, what is going on? I am deep in a place of learning. Um, and it's, I think that when you are a creative and particularly a creative, like in my space where I have put out at least one or two games and one or two books and a handful of stories for most of the years of my life, um, being in a learning space is really tricky because you're not putting work out in the world. And it's really easy to start feeling like you have been forgotten or that mm -hmm. you are, um, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing or or those kinds of things. And so I'm in this really intense space right now of, of learning some things that I have been able to uh, kind of cover over because of my other skills, that main thing being plotting and pacing because mm -hmm. ah, it's so hard for me. Um, and so I, I'm doing a lot of deep work. I'm doing a lot of revision. I'm do, spending a lot of time crafting a thing. And so I think I think particularly in today's world of like having things out there all the time and right. social media and presenting and being here, like it can be really hard to find space to pull back and just sink deep into the next thing that you need to learn to get better. And so if you don't do that, you don't get better. And then in 20 years, you're still doing this. And I say this from experience, <laughs> you're still doing this, the social media and the pushing and the writing the same books and having the same flaws and having the same responses. And so like, if you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like there's a place that you need to get to as a creative, it's, it's okay to pull back from the world. Nobody's going to forget about you for very long. You'll come back, you'll come back stronger um, but I know that there's a lot of pressure. And so if you're in that place, I feel you and you're doing the right thing. And if you feel like you should be in that place, like I feel like, you know, ask yourself. And if the answer is yes, give it a try, but don't expect it to be easy. It's pretty hard. It can be kind of isolating. Um, but I know that when I'm done, I'll have learned this really important skill and I will have made something amazing. And that's in the long term, that's kind of the... And that, but that is the challenge, right? I have thought yeah. about this myself. I'm working on a trilogy right now and I've got, you know, short fiction and stuff coming out. And so it's, it's, it's like this continuous churn. And I thought maybe when I finish this trilogy, I'll disappear for 10 years and just yeah. work on some, you know, some yeah. project. And, you know, so I feel that tension of like, you've got to be creating the next thing every, you know, you should have a book coming out this frequently and you've got to get to 20 titles and all that. And it's like, or maybe I just kind of vanish until I've got the one that I want to. <laughs> yeah. That that's that's very real. Uh, but you're right; there is a lot of pressure to constantly be thinking about. The only way for me to appear to people is to produce another thing quickly. Yes. And like, no, maybe I'm saying, hey, I'm I'm still over here, but I'm just doing the work, and yeah. I'm not going to see the work for a while because I want to get it right, and that that is hard. It's um, yeah, it's that idea for me. The thing I keep in my head all the time is. Um, progress rather than impress and mm -hmm. so like I think about it when I go to the gym and like you're next to this person who's like 
you know, just yeah. <laughs> 20 and amazing. And, you know, here I am going, you sweating to death. It's like, all right, progress, right? When I'm 60, I want to be able to do the movements. I want to have the power. I want to have the strength. Like it's, I'm not here to impress. I'm here to progress. And like, I think about all the time when I'm in a place where I feel uncomfortable or I feel like I'm being, you know, when, when I it would be really easy for me to get up in my own head and, you know, writing is for sure one of those places. Um, I'm going to steal that. That's going <laughs> to for me. That is helpful because yeah, I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. Like, Hey, I, you know, the, 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 so much of our, our, our career is about finding the readers. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I want to be a reader focused author. Like what is, how am I serving my reader? But you're right. It can be very much. It can lend itself to you fall into the pit of I'm. I'm just trying to impress the next reader. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to 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 get better as an artist. So yeah, that is. That's. I like that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take that. <laughs> Please do. So outside of your career, what's something that you are hoping people will will learn? Uh, you know that that you've been discovering lately. The thing that I have been discovering. Uh, I, I have so many things, but my answer, one of my answers is, um, so I have this fantastic therapist, as I mentioned, who every time we start a session, the question that she asks me is what's alive in you right now? And it isn't a judgment question. Like it could, the thing that's alive in me could be amazing. It could be some joy bubbling up that I'm super excited about. It could be some hard thing that's, that's in there. That's sort of squirmy and I don't really want to look at it. And, um, but this idea of like, what's alive in you has, it, it helps me because when I ask it to myself, it's hard to lie to yourself about that. But you could be like, self, am I okay? And yourself is like, yeah, we're fucking right. up. We're awesome. I'm so sorry. We're awesome. Um, and then, but but if you ask yourself what's alive, yeah. I think, first of all, you'll be so surprised at how often that's some kind of joy, mm. some kind of gratitude, some kind of an amazing response that you will surprise you. Um, and then also sometimes asking what's alive in you, you'll find some little hidden thing that has been bugging you, but that you haven't looked at or you haven't thought about, or maybe you've tried to swallow for a while. And so like, this is a question that's hard to ask. It's, I mean, I super recommended doing it with some assistance because it can get really deep and intense. So that's sort of a content warning on it. Um, but I also think it affects how I respond to other people because, you know, one of the things that I absolutely cannot stand is small talk. And so if I meet someone or if I'm spending time with someone that I don't know very well, I find that I can, I'm not going to ask them what's alive in them because it's a little bit too like up in your face. I was, was going to say, happening. like I can imagine, right? that, you know, but I, a stranger on the street. That's a little yeah, bit. Yeah, right. So that's not my personality at all. But when I think it about them, when I think mm -hmm. at them, like what is alive in this person, it gives me a sort of different way of interacting with them where I can, I can, I can kind of pay attention to the things that they're talking about or, or sort of maybe not talking about. And you can just kind of get a little bit deeper, I think, by having that idea in your head of like, I want to connect this person on this real level beyond the sort of superficial, if they're comfortable with it, right? We're not just sort of <laughs> digging into someone's psyche, but like, you know, sort of inviting them to move into that space with you. And um, it's just one of the ways that I, I think about other people now that allows me to get a little bit deeper with them. And I think, because there's also lo lots of levels, right? What's alive in you at the top? It's like, oh, I just had a great day and the best coffee and like, and that's still alive in them, right? So if you only know someone sort of that well, it's still better than talking about the weather, unless they're super excited about the weather. Right. Um, and so, the, but then you can go deeper as you get to know someone and, and you start talking about, you know, and I do ask my like very close friends, like what's alive in you right now? Because uh, we are close enough. Yeah that that's a, the kind of conversation that we have and it's a great sort of cue to be like now we're going to get deep now we're going to get yeah. <laughs> really and, get into and, what's... and the, this is safe like yeah the, you know you can the, that is that because I mean, it is a scary question like when i started right. like, you know just hearing it the first time i was like uh, uh i got some fears that i don't really want to yeah. Like acknowledge right. maybe that's what's you know i like wormy i like that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, wormy is good yeah right? sometimes it's wormy stuff uh is yeah. you know um and it's not like superficial this was irritating it's like right. and the irritations are often a way that i'm protecting myself from something that's really that i don't you know yeah. Uh, but yeah that is a that is a great question and you're right i think it, it you know the the that sense of changing the way we're listening you know if you're yeah. looking for that what is that yeah. that is interesting how that you know, changes the way you're, you're thinking about that conversation. Right. I mean, cause of course there's, con there's always consent, even in conversation, you're not, you're not digging into someone's space, right? You have to, you have to listen and read their body language and understand just how close you are because otherwise 
you're overstepping or understepping. Like sometimes people want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Like I find, you know, because I write about sex a lot, because I have books out that are nonfiction about sex, people want to talk to me about sex because they don't have anywhere else to go that feels safe. And so even like, I am often surprised at how deep the conversation can be with a stranger, someone who's read a book of mine, someone who's heard about me, who really needs just a safe space to say a thing that's been inside them forever. Um, and that's when I first started, that was, that was woe for me. I was just like, what's happening. <laughs> um, but when people are genuine about it, as opposed to people who are using that as sort of a uh, thing which can happen too but when people are genuine about it I want to be able to hold that space for them right I want them to have a positive experience of of taking this really scary deep thing that they've probably been wanting to do for a really long time and making it safe for them so I think there's all kinds of ways right the more power you have the more space you can hold for other people right the more age and experience and knowledge you have the more space you can hold for other people and so I think that there's this also this understanding of of how in sort of our power and growth, we can empower and grow others. And, and that's really important too, I think for me. Yeah, I, 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 viewers will see, I literally grabbed a piece of paper and wrote something as you were speaking because I don't think I've ever heard, or at least it's certainly not in my vocabulary, the word understepping and it's marvelous. Like I, we, we are so cognizant of the, the danger of overstepping boundaries. And I think that's evolutionary, you know, if we're living in communities of 30 people in the, you know, in the, the Serengeti, if you overstepped your boundaries and you got kicked out, you died. But like, the idea that people have boundaries and we're not we're not getting near enough to them. Yeah. I need to import that into my book. <laughs> I literally wrote it down. I'm like, I need That's to cool. I need to do some thinking about that. And I need to do some <laughs> writing about that. How I am I it. understepping and not meet, meeting people where they need to be? That's a wonderful yeah. phrase. Understepping boundaries. <laughs> That's cool. Very right? scary, right? Because yeah. you're really it's like you're not actually stepping toward but you're inviting a step toward you like it, it it's 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 that dance right and yeah. and uh, it's so scary and so easy to get wrong and you just have to go into it with such a big open heart and like I don't know I don't I, I find the people that I connect with best are the people who can sort of do that for me too but it, we don't nobody teaches us this stuff no. it's so much easier to just be like no we're you're gonna just stay over here I'm gonna stay over here and and I think that there's also, there's not a, there's not a conversation or a language about how to get close in that space. And there's also not a conversation about like, if you do overstep, how to make that okay, if it's accidental, right? I mean, how we overstep heal. each other yeah. all the time. And that's not, it's often not on purpose. It's not malignant. It's an accident. And we're trying to figure this out together. And so also making space for people to make those kinds of mistakes is yeah thing we're not taught and is also super important well and i think it's because we don't have the language to do that healing if we overstep the 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 impulse then is to say i am aware that this person has a boundary it's way over there but the right. safest thing for me to not do to do is just never approach right. because i know I, I won't ever cross a boundary if i and so then we don't connect and so yep understepping that there is a burden to get closer to right you know uh, we're building a world with language this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's really cool um so uh what is something that has been you know i'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, the the books you have been reading have been uh you know helpful <laughs> to me as well what is in your to read pile what are you looking forward to oh um you know i'm gonna pick up my phone here because i have a bunch <laughs> <laughs> um, so Kelly Link has a novel that just came out called The Book of Love that I'm super excited about. And it looks amazing. I love Kelly's work. Um, it's just very cool. I'm reading this book right now called A Woman's Guide to Power Unbound, which is written by a woman who is, I believe, a nun and a dominatrix. And it is incredible. It's really fascinating. Um, All oh. is Well is the other book I'm reading by Mona Awad. Um, and then let me look at my library list. Yeah, All Second. is Well. Uh, and Mona Awad also wrote Bonnie's weirdest book ever. I loved it. Uh, I just picked up Delilah Dawson's Bloom. Um, I'm reading Premium Hobbits, The Annual Migration of Clouds. And yeah, those are my big ones right now. Yeah. Oh, those are great. So I will link to those in the show notes so folks can check those out. I'm. What's the one that's written by a nun and dominatrix? <laughs> it is called, my friend who's an actor recommended it. And she always recommends good books. So I picked it up as soon as she recommended it. Let me... 
I can't ever remember the name of it. Uh, a Woman's Guide to Power Unbound. And the author's name is, where's the cover? The author's name, I should have put my reading glasses on, <laughs> is um, Hesia Urbaniak. I'm not sure if I'm reading, saying that correctly. Okay, well, I will I will find it and I'll put that in the show notes so folks Pretty can cool. look that up. That is I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the life that I have known and I'm like, that is not, uh, those are not two career paths that overlap, uh, uh, easily. Uh, so that would, that's really, really interesting. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, so one of the things that I have been asking authors about as, you know, I've been having them on is th this, this kind of concept of the, the kind of outrage machine of the algorithms <laughs> that, it is so extreme now that I I come across things people will say out there in the world and I think, does this person actually believe this or is this just to garner attention? And how much does that then toxify kind of our, <laughs> our, our interaction where people are saying the, the worst possible thing they can think of? And so to either satirize that or lean into it, what <laughs> is your your thing that would be, you know, your your big controversial, outrageous opinion? Um, <laughs> I'm going to pick this because I have a black lab and I'm going to say that the absolute best place to pet a dog is that soft spot right between her ears. <laughs> oh, yes, that could be debated. Nobody There's going to be somebody out there that is just going to be intense. <laughs> You know, if I think on my puppies, it's that that area of of skin right between their leg, and you know they flop down on their back, and then if you hit that spot, the leg starts going. You know that I think they would say that's their favorite. So already you're in debate with. Oh, uh, good. Yes, I love puppy. it. That's excellent. They'd be like, no, it's right here. It's what is that? I, th there's a name for that. Like it's a it's a tenderloin on a steak. Yeah, like, <laughs> that is the uh, the, the spot. For, that's their tickle <laughs> place. But yeah. between the ears, okay, right between the ears. And some dogs love ear contact and some dogs do not. For and sure. so that's, you know, you, yeah, you, you, you've started a hot debate with people who aren't on Twitter with dogs. They're not, you know, they're not going to be able to, uh, to go, you're wrong, <laughs> you're wrong. And well, actually, <laughs> uh, that's excellent. So where can folks find you online? And they are looking after this interview. They're like, I have got to read her work. Where are they going to be able to find <laughs> Um, well, if you're looking for game stuff, it's montycookgames.com. I'm the co-owner and also one of the lead designers, um, and you can find all of my game products on there. And then um, anything for fiction or or just general Shauna stuff, which is kind of how I do my social media, um, you can find me at shaunagermain.com, which is my website. And then I'm I'm under Shauna Germain anywhere that social media exists right now. That's mostly Blue Sky, Facebook, and Instagram. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, so who would be somebody that you would recommend that I have on the show? Uh, I'm going to recommend James Sutter. Have you talked to him? No, he, I have not. He's, this, he's a former um, game designer, although maybe he's still designing games a little bit, who's moved into novels. And he writes these queer romances that are so beautiful and sweet and full of ghosts and music. And um, and he just has tons of interesting things to say about writing. Excellent. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, well, I will certainly reach out. So before we get to our send off and your last piece of advice for folks, so there are some folks I have to thank. Uh, thanks to uh, the artist Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for the intro to our show, I Prefer the Dusk. Let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland with three Ds. And thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. If you're in a band and you'd like your song used on the show, I'd love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song. So email me about that. Uh, thanks, as always, to Doug, the producer, for making this show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. And I cannot forget to mention Writers Not Writing is a production of Not A Pie Publishing. So please go to notapiepublishing.com. Check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate and review it wherever you found it. And please check out, check out Shauna's newest game, The Devil's Dandy Dogs, and tell a friend about it, too. Even a short review, a single click on that fifth star makes a huge difference. So do Sean a favor, play the game, cry, and then <laughs> hop online, give it that fifth star and say, this game made somebody in our party cry. Uh, that, that, will, that will make Shauna's day. It will. Uh, and then... Um, and then for the show as well, you know, if you if you leave a funny comment, if you leave a, a, a review, I would love that. I'll read some on the show. So, I, I, you know, I, I'm too old to say smash that like button, but, you know, uh, tap on the, the thumbs up an odd number of times. I'll appreciate it. Um, so, Shauna and I want you to remember three things for this week. Uh, Shauna, what's your advice for everybody going into this next week? Um, ask what's alive in you. 
pet all the doggos with permission, of course, uh, and remember who you are. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even think I can add anything to that other than to remember this next week, no matter how much you procrastinate, we're still proud of you. My time.